All right, very good. So, so we have to move fast, right? Because we have lunch after this. So um, there, is a, there is more incentive to, to do many things, OK? So let's start lecture number two. So let's start with a brief review of what we did yesterday. So yesterday, we decided to study scattering amplitudes, right? So that's the idea. The idea is to consider scattering amplitudes. We gave some motivations. And the strategy is going to be to simplify as much as we can every structure that can appear in the scattering amplitude. So the first kind of a structure is the kinematics. The second is what I call the dynamics. And the third, yesterday I said color, but I decided to change my mind, and it's going to be supersymmetry. The reason is that the target for these lectures, yesterday I called these applications, but the target of these lectures is going to write down the complete three-level S-matrix of the effective field theory living on a PV brain and on a M5 brain. OK? So that's the goal, or the target for these lectures. Let's see if we make it all the way there. So in order to do that, we started to warm up with the kinematics in four and six dimensions. And yesterday, we started as well with the dynamics, which is the topic that we're going to pick up again today. And I defined the dynamics just because I could, since I'm giving the lectures, as the part of the lecture that has to do with the singularities of the S matrix and the possible residues that we can have. So any amplitude at three level can only have simple poles given by the location where the propagators blow up, right? And that's determined by locality. Now the residue at those poles is determined by unitarity to be the product of a smaller amplitudes. And in order to study the dynamics, we decided to study the case of scalar particles. because it was simpler. If you remember the kinematics, yesterday, to study the kinematics, we prepared the ground or we did the groundwork for particles with a spin. But today, we will mainly concentrate on scalar particles. So what's the advantage of concentrating on scalar particles? The advantage is that any scattering amplitude for any number of particles is given by a function. And there is some feedback, right? So OK, let's see. So it's given by a function of kinematic invariance. Yeah, if I, if I get closer to the, oh, yeah, it might be the speakers there. So it's only a function of the Mandelstag invariance given by the sum of momenta where the momenta of each particle are defined to be null vectors and they are supposed to satisfy momentum conservation. So yesterday we made a big deal out of these two conditions, saying we have n quadratic conditions, d linear conditions, how can we solve them? You got homework, which I'm sure you all did. I haven't seen any of the papers on the archives yet, but uh, I'm sure they are coming. Um, but for the scalar particles, life is way simpler than 
what I showed you yesterday. And the reason is that all we have to do is to introduce a matrix Kn of Mandelstam invariance. The diagonals are zero because we're dealing with massless particles. And I was able to demonstrate very clearly yesterday that I'm not able to do arithmetic on the blackboard. But I have to use Mathematica to do it. So yesterday, what we did was to count the number of parameters in this matrix. And what we said, or I'm not going to blame you, what I said was that we have, this is a symmetric matrix. So we have n times n plus 1 over 2 components. We are imposing that the diagonals are 0. So we are subtracting n. And then I said, of course, that you can do the arithmetic in your mind, that this was n minus 3, n times n minus 3 over 2, which is clearly wrong, right? Well, it's clearly wrong, but I left a space here. OK, that's the part you didn't see yesterday, but check the lectures. So the reason I left the space, I'm sure I didn't. So is the following. Just the fact that this matrix has zeros in the diagonals is not enough, and that is symmetric, is not enough to ensure that we have a space of kinematic invariance coming from particles that satisfy these conditions. We also have to impose that Kn has a null vector. So Kn has to annihilate this vector, okay? which is the same as to say that the sum of the columns has to be equal to 0. And that happens to be n conditions. So we remove n from here. And now you can put it in mathematics and get the number that I claim. So this is the dimensionality of the space of kinematic invariance, so the dimension of the space of these matrices is n times n minus 3 over 2. Okay? And we also said that if you're in low dimensions, then things can happen. There are accidental linear dependencies because you're in low dimension. And then these metrics can have a smaller number of independent parameters. But just as it stands, it's clear that the determinant of these metrics is what? is zero. But if you have a matrix whose rows and columns add up to zero, mathematicians have seen these matrices many, many times. They come from graph theory, and they define something that is called the determinant prime of those matrices. You can show very easily that if you remove any row and any column of this matrix, the determinant will not depend First of all, you're going to get a determinant that hopefully is not zero, unless there is something else special happening. But the answer that you're going to get will not depend on the row or the column that you have removed. So I'm going to define as well the determinant prime of this matrix to be the determinant of the submatrix after you remove the i-th row and the j-th column. And this definition doesn't depend on the choice. This is an exercise for you to show. Okay. And then you have learned something interesting about graph theory. All right. Then what we did was to move on to try and apply this to four particles. And we said that the space for four particles is only two-dimensional. And you all know that very well, because that's the case we study in quantum field theory very often. In fact, four particles is so special that we even give special names to the Mandelstam variables. We call them S, T, and U. Now, what S is, T, and U are is up for debate. I think S is pretty standard to be 
k1 plus k2 square. Let's see. So if you're late for lunch, just play in the blackboard. OK. So for n equals 4, we have that the dimension of k4 is 2. And we have the Mandelstam invariance s1, s3, s1, 2, s3, 4 is equal to s. So my choice would be that S23, that is equal to S14, I'm going to call it T, and that S13, S24, I'm going to call it U. But now you see that I have three variables, so there must be one relation. And of course, we know that the relation is that this thing is equal to four times the mass square, but we are dealing with massless particles, so we have zero here. And yesterday, I drew this picture. And I said, well, I'm going to choose s and t to be, to be my independent variables. And I said that this space is so boring that it doesn't know any physics. Why it doesn't know any physics? Because we know that if we have, say, this theory, a phi cube theory, the four particle amplitude is lambda square 1 over s plus 1 over t plus 1 over u. And therefore, the possible places where I can have singularities are the places where, say, t vanishes or s vanishes or u. Moreover, we know that if we were dealing with more complicated scattering amplitudes, well, the same is true for this one, but it's a little bit boring because three particle amplitudes in this theory are just a coupling constant. This four particle amplitude if we sit here, if we go very close to the singularity, we will find that the scattering amplitude will factor in such a way that particles 1 and 4 will combine to produce an on-shell particle. And we will get 2 and 3 here. In this case of u, we will get 1, 3 and 2, 4. And here, the amplitude will look like this. 1, 2, 3, 4. OK? So the challenge that we posed ourselves yesterday was to find a space that knows more physics than this. So I'll make a proposal for what that space is. Any questions? No? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you all want to know what the space is. Right? So here is a proposal. for a space that knows more physics than that is the space of all Riemann spheres with four mark points. OK? You say, well, why is spheres we have anything to do with that picture? Well, let's first start by asking what a Riemann sphere is. Well, a Riemann sphere is a sphere. But there must be something special about this sphere, because otherwise it wouldn't be called a Riemann sphere. Does anybody know why we call it Riemann? What makes this? What makes a sphere a Riemann sphere? It's not just any sphere. Right? What do we have to attach to it? 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now we know that Boris knows what a Riemann sphere is. <laughs> yes, so we have to touch a complex structure. In other words, we have to find ways of giving complex coordinates to this sphere. Okay? Very good. So, well, I don't know. One possibility is to define the stereographic projection, and then we define some complex coordinates z. And we have four mark points. So how do we denote what are these four mark points? Well, just any four marks you make on the sphere. Now let's denote the position of those mark points, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and sigma 4. Okay? Now the fact that this is a Riemann sphere, as we said, is the fact that we have a complex structure. So we define some complex coordinates on the sphere, but it turns out that if we can make any reassignment any holomorphic transformation that is globally defined on the sphere, then the corresponding new sphere is not actually something different. It's the same complex manifold as the one we had before. So we have to model out by transformations or changes of coordinates that will leave the complex structure the same. So any transformation of this coordinate by something of this form leaves the complex structure the same. So we have to study, to study this space, we have to study the space of all these spheres with these four points, mod out by this group of transformations. Uglier than the, okay. Where this is a SL2C transformation. Okay. Now, have we ever seen any complex sphere in nature? Have you guys ever seen any complex sphere in nature? Well, after Dionysius talk yesterday, you might say no, but uh, but. Forget about the seater and all that. Just pretend that we're in Minkowski space. Well, the answer is yes. Every, every, every day at night, you see a complex sphere. So the celestial sphere is literally a complex sphere. The reason is that you can see that the points on the celestial sphere, the null rays that are coming to your eyes, they form a sphere, right? And the, if you apply Lorentz transformations on that sphere, the points on that sphere transform precisely according to SL2C. Okay. So there is indeed a complex sphere in nature. And we see this SL2C as the Lorentz transformations acting on it. Okay? That's what got Penrose excited. And he introduced Twister space based on that idea. But that's not what we're going to do. We're going to keep going and try to study this structure. So, if we are free to perform this transformation, this is a three-dimensional group. It means that we can fix three of these mark points to anywhere we want. Okay? So I'm going to use... Oh, I have to say, so there is a warning here. So everything that I'm going to say after this, if you try to relate it to the celestial sphere, that's your own responsibility. Okay? So I have no idea if what I'm about to say has any connection with that. So if you find it, let me know. So use SL2C to fix sigma 1 to 0, sigma 3 to 1, and sigma 4 to infinity. So it seems I'm missing something, right? Well, sigma 2, I'm going to leave it free. In fact, so I'm going to call it Z. All right. So what do we have? So let's see if we can draw it here. In fact, it might be 
a good idea to So while I erase this part of the blackboard, your job is to try and figure out what the space looks like. The space of Riemann spheres with four pointers or four mark points. All right, let's see. Hopefully by the time we're done, this will be dry. All right. So what do we have? So for any particular value z2, we get a complex sphere. If we change the value z2 of sigma2, remember the other three points are fixed then we get a different sphere. We are guaranteed to get a different sphere because those two will not be related by, uh, by, this, by any transformation because we have used all the freedom in the transformation to fix these guys. So fixing sigma 1 to be at 0, sigma 3 to be at 1, and sigma 4 to be at infinity allows us to have sigma 2 at any point z, which I'm going to draw here on the complex plane z. And as we move on the complex plane z, we get different spheres. But is there anything special that can happen in this space z as we move along? Yes. Yeah, exactly. If this additional point approaches one of the others, we might be in trouble. Those seem to be special points. So there is a point, z equals to 0, where we will get, as we move here, we'll get a sphere that looks like this. We will get sigma 1 equals to 0, and z is getting very, very close to it. And we will have sigma 3 equals to 1 here, and sigma 4 is still at infinity. There would also be another point where the sphere now looks like this. We'll have 0, 1, and z is coming very close here. And here, we're going to have a sphere where z is very close to infinity. OK? So this is starting to look good. In this space, there are three singular points. And we need three special singularities. So this is starting to look good. Now, there is something strange here. We are having that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are coming very, very close to each other. But 4 and 3 are very far from each other. So this looks as if 1 and 2 are special, or as if 2 was special. But know that that's only a, the consequence of the SL2C choice that I made. If I change my SL2C gauge fixing, so this is like a gauge redundancy. So if I change the SL2C choice I made here and say I let sigma 3 to be free and I fix sigma 2 to be at 1, what do you think this guy is going to look like? I'm going to get something that seems to be different, but it's going to be exactly the same sphere with the same complex structure. But it's going to look different. What it's going to look like, so this is going to be equivalent to another picture, where instead, sigma 1 is here, or the point 1 is here, our point 2 is here, and 3 and 4 are very, very close together. So it looks very different, but it's going to be the same complex sphere. So it's going to represent the same point on the model space of these spheres. The same thing is going to happen here. I can choose another set, another choice of SL2C, where instead of having sigma 1 
sigma 2 and sigma 3 and sigma 4 here, then what's going to happen is that sigma 1 and sigma 4 are going to be very close to each other, and sigma 2 and sigma 3 are going to be far from each other. Now, mathematicians have found a nice way of describing this space, which makes a more democratic picture for what is happening at this point. And what they do is that this space has a singularity, and they blow up the singularity to make it look nicer and more symmetric. And the blow up picture looks like this. So I'm going to draw a picture such that these two points look very, very close to each other. So if you are standing here, say, on sigma 3, you see these two points very, very close to each other here. But what if you were standing on sigma 1? What happens is that you see 3 and 4 very, very close to each other. So this is a picture that mathematicians have come up with. So the only way to make this picture democratic is to have two spheres that now touch at a point, and you put sigma 1 and sigma 2 on one of them, and sorry, sigma 4 and sigma 3 on the other one. So if you pretend that you are in, on sigma 1, you only see this point, this mark point, which is where 4 and 3 are together from this point of view or this frame. And if you're sitting on sigma 4, you're going to see these two points as if they were very, very close to each other from this point of view. Okay? Now I hope you're seeing the parallel of the pictures. Doesn't this look like this? Well, not like this one, right? It looks more like this one. What if we drew the same picture for this one? Well, the same blow-up story will give rise to two spheres, one where you have sigma 1 and sigma 4, and one where you have sigma 2 and sigma 3. And the same thing will happen for this one. You will have your two pictures. And you will have sigma 4, sigma 2, and sigma 1, and sigma 3. Yes? Yeah, the blow-up procedure is a procedure where you replace a complex manifold. You replace a point, so you replace a manifold, an algebraic variety by another one, such that you define a projection onto the other one that is one-to-one -one everywhere, but at a special point, you get a sphere. So you... Um, so let me see how, how can I explain it better. Well, that's the correct explanation. I'm just trying to find another way to say it. Um, uh, let me see. Right. So imagine that you have something like this, right? living on the plane. So this seems to be singular at this point, right? So now I'm going to replace this by another space that maps one to one everywhere, except here, where I want to blow it up. Sorry, so if you want to blow that up, then you might want to resolve the singularity, but here, there, in the uh, vertical space itself, you do not have any singularity you don't have any singularity. Have space. No, of course I have a singularity. Yes, this is a singularity because the punctures are coming to each other. Oh, I see you want to see the singularity, so here is the singularity. So now let me draw this space like this. There you have it. 
So this is my picture for M24, M04. 0 is a genus, and 4 is a number of mark points. In, a sca in the scattering amplitude, sorry? Yes, okay. So this space is non compact, okay? What I'm drawing here with the blow up is the compactification of that space, which is done through the, through the blow up, okay? So now the picture where I replace this. is actually called the compactification of the space, okay? Now, I hope I've convinced you that the compactification of this space seems to have at least the same structure as the physics that we want to impose on the boring space that we have here, okay? Now, the question is, how can we map K4 into M04, now with a bar to be precise, such that physics maps to singularities. Okay? Now, we could come out with a very complicated story, perhaps a general, a general description of how to do this or to derive it, but let's try to be simple-minded. So, from the point of view that I have here, where I set up sigma 1 to be 0, sigma 3 to be 1, and sigma 4 to be infinity, all we want is to come out with a function Sigma 2 should be a function of S, T, and U. That does what? So if we want to map these singularities to this picture, what do we need? So we need that sigma 2 goes to 0 when what? What would you, what would you ask the, kinem the kinematic invariance to do? So sigma 2 going to 0 means that sigma 2 approaches sigma 1, so we get this picture. This picture, the blow up looks like this picture, and that looks like this one, we should map to this singularity. So we need this when S goes to zero. We would like sigma 2 to go to 1 when T goes to zero, and sigma 2 to go to infinity when u goes to infinity. So I'll give you two minutes, maybe one minute, it's so easy, one minute, yes, to find out the simplest function that does that. The simplest function of s, t, and u, rational function. Of course, don't come out with a, I don't know, polylogarithm of, uh, just a rational function of s, t, and u that does this, okay? So try to find it. And I'm going to be in trouble because I forgot this. Okay. Did you find it? Yes. So we can check. Maybe I made a mistake. Let me see. No. Ah. <laughs> this one goes up. This one is up. Okay. If we want to check. Sorry, the question is? Yes. yes. Yeah, sigma 2 going to 4. Oh, I, I, I messed it up. Okay, let's. No, <laughs> not that one. Unbelievable.
So sigma 2 goes to infinity means that sigma 2 and sigma 4 are close to each other. Which one is wrong? Oh, it's not going to infinity. Yes, yes, sorry, yes, of course. Thank you. It's going to zero, yes. OK, so I'm sure you all came out with a solution. Now you had more than two minutes, so there is no excuse, right? So you should write it on a piece of paper and then show it in front. No, I'm kidding. I mean, that's, that's for undergraduates. Uh, so anyone? Where would be sigma 2, the simplest possible one? Exactly. That's the simplest function that does what we want. Now, you could come out with crazier functions. But we also have to require that this function can be turned into an equation that is SL to C covariant. OK? So we need this to turn into something that is SL to C covariant. And moreover, it has to be consistent with everything else that we have set on the board for any choice of SL to C gauge fixing. So how can we do that? Well, SL to C, we saw how it acts on the coordinates. So first of all, there is an SL to C transformation of the form 1B01. And this means that sigma goes to sigma plus some number. So we need. differences of locations of the punctures or the mark points in order to, be, to have something that it has a chance of being invariant under SL to C or covariant. So in this case, it will be invariant under these translations. But more generally, now if we have sigma A minus sigma B, I want you to show that under a general SL to C transformation, what happens to this? Does anybody know? Just If you apply this to each of the sigmas, this will be invariant under translations, but under a more general SL to C transformation, this thing will pick up a factor, which is of the form Okay? So keep this in mind because it's gonna be useful later today. I hope it's today. I'm not sure. Okay. So how can we translate this into something that is SL to C covariant? So I have a proposal. Well, first we have to turn this into differences. So maybe we should turn this into sigma 2 minus sigma 1, because sigma 1 is equal to 0. Okay? So you could play along that game. Sigma 2 minus sigma 1 is equal to minus S12 over S13. Now you would say, well, S13, if I have sigma 1 and sigma 2 here and S12 here, is tempting to say, well, why don't I put here something that has 1 and 3, something like this, 3 minus 1. After all, with the gauge fixing that I chose, 3 minus sigma 3 minus 1 is equal to 1, so this would work. But how about sigma 4? So we don't have anything that has to do with sigma 4. But sigma 4 is going to infinity, so maybe it cancels out if we had something else here. Well, you can play this game for some time, and you might perhaps come out with something like this that looks a little more symmetric. Now, is this equivalent to this? Well, it is, because sigma 4 is going to infinity, so we can drop it from here. So this goes to 0, because sigma 4 is going to infinity. And this gives precisely the condition that I have written here. OK? Now, that equation is invariant under translations. And you would say, well, but it doesn't look invariant under this transformation, but it is because of momentum conservation. So S, the sum of these three numbers is equal to zero, and it guarantees that it's also 
is now going to be covariant under this transformation. OK. Let's see. We have 15 minutes. Now, this equation seems to make the mark point 1 very special. What if we replace that by an equation that looks identical to that one, but we switch, say, 1 and 2? So let's replace this by something like this. Would I get the same condition on sigma 2? Even worse, what if I replace from here 1 and 4? That way will look even more surprising. Are all these equations giving the same information for sigma 2? You'd say, well, certainly this one doesn't seem to give you anything nice, because every term is going to 0 when I take sigma 4 to infinity. Is that too naive? Well, it is too naive. And the reason it's naive is the following. Take this, but expand sigma 4 minus sigma a around sigma 4 equals to infinity. So you get something that looks like this, right, to leading order. Now we put it back here, and we see that in this equation you will get a factor of sigma 4, which we are taking to infinity, so we haven't done it yet. So let's just leave it here. So what happens is that we get S41, which is the same as S23, which is what I call T, over or times sigma 1. OK. So first of all, we're going to get ST plus U, or T plus U plus S, from this one. Right? Now, this is equal to 0 by momentum conservation, plus the next part would be T sigma 1, all this thing will be divided by sigma 4, plus u sigma 2, plus, last one is s sigma 3. Now, if you plug that sigma 3 is equal to 1 and sigma 1 is equal to 0, you get precisely that u sigma 2 plus s sigma 3 is equal to 0 which is the equation we have over there. So all these equations are giving you exactly the same information. So we have four equations, but only one of them is linearly independent from the rest. So what do I want to do? Let me see. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it on this blackboard. Yeah. yeah, I had to try all four, right? All four possibilities. Um, actually, what I want is. So what have we found? We have found a way of connecting the space of kinematic invariance for four particles and 
the modular space of Riemann surfaces of genus zero with four mark points in such a way that all the physics we want maps nicely into the model space and it matches the singularities. Now, how can we generalize this? Well, in order to generalize this, let me show something that is interesting. Let me construct the following matrix. It's going to be a matrix very similar to our KN, except that I'm going to have I'm going to divide every entry by the corresponding difference of sigmas. Okay, so if you did, if you wrote down this matrix for four particles, how would you get these equations that I showed you on the board here on top? What would these equ equations look like? Just I give you, let me give you a hint. They would look like a condition for this matrix. Let me call this matrix the matrix AN. In fact, so let me it would be nice to also call this, oh, I'm not going to reach. Let's call this matrix the matrix KN. So look at this matrix. The condition for this matrix to be the matrix that describes the space of kinematic invariance for on-shell particles was given by this condition here that this matrix had a null vector. What do you think is the condition that would imply these equations if we had four particles? Would be? Yes, but, the, but okay, that's true. The determinant of A has to be zero. However, what happens but we need something more. I mean, we want slightly, a slightly more refined condition to get this. We have to have information about what the null vector looks like. What should the null vector look like? You see, if you set n equals to 4, and you require that this is a null vector of this matrix, when you have this times the null vector, you're going to get the equation that I wrote down on the top. You multiply this by the null vector, you get the, equa the second equation that I wrote down, and the fourth guy by the null vector, and you will get this equation. So the claim is that the way to map the space of kinematic invariance to the modular space of Riemann spheres with m mark points is through the following constraint that this is true for any number of particles. Now, let me write it as follows. This condition is equivalent to this condition. Of course, if you want to be very, very precise, okay? Now, this just provides a way of getting points on this modular space once you're given a matrix K 
you can give me points here by solving these equations. But the claim is even more precise. So the proposal So let me define this to be EA. The proposal is that this scattering equations map Kn to M0n in such a way that poles determined by locality map to singularities and residues that are determined by unitarity map to the blow-up structure. OK? So this is the space that knows all the physics we need in order to trivialize or to contain all the information we need. So what do we want? We want to write every possible scattering amplitude. So any scattering amplitude. Now you, now you see the reason for my notation here. So this is the matrix AN, and this is the scattering amplitude of M particles. So the proposal is that in order to make locality and unitarity manifest in any scattering amplitude, what you have to do is to use this modular space as the space that you integrate over. The kinematic invariant will tell you which points you have to choose. And the way to express that in formulas is to say that you're going to integrate over all possible locations of the mark points modulo, or not modulo, but modulo SL to C transformations. But the points you're going to choose in this space are not any random points. These are the points that solve these equations. And the theory that you're going to consider is a theory that is going to define an integrand that depends on the location of the mark points, the momenta, and possibly any other quantum numbers of the particles, such as polarization vectors. But in a particular way, the dependence on momenta and polarization vectors has to be only polynomial. Because All singularity structure are captured by the integration on this space. Okay? So this is a conjecture that we made with Song He. And Ellis Juan in 2013. So, after realizing that these equations connect you to a space that knows all the physics that you want, we were led to the conjecture that such formulas would exist for any scattering amplitude. It was a conjecture at the time because we didn't have any examples for which this would work. But then, on Thursday, we're going to work out possible things that we can write down here that will give rise 
to the complete S metrics of certain theories, and then hopefully we're going to be able to complete the goal of producing formulas for the D brains and the M5 brain. Okay? So, uh, yeah, I started five minutes late, right? So I can have five more minutes. Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, it's just that we have these metrics here, so it would be a pity not to do something with it, right? So there is something interesting about these metrics, which is that the first one was symmetric. This one is anti-symmetric. So is it possible for an anti-symmetric matrix? OK. And now let me take n to be even. Is it possible for an even anti-symmetric matrix to have only one null vector? I don't think so, right? So you should have another, at least another one. So if n is even, can anyone guess another null vector of this matrix? Okay. So an exercise show that this is an old vector of this matrix on the support of these equations. Okay? Now once you have a matrix that has more than one null eigenvector, how can we define its determinant? It sounds a little complicated, because we, le we knew how to do it in that case. But in this case, it's not, clear, it's not clear how to define it. We will have to remove two rows and two columns in order to have something that has a chance of working. So if we compute the determinant of this matrix, we're going to get 0. But we want to find the corresponding version of determinant prime of this matrix. Now the space of null vectors forms a 2 by m matrix, or an m by 2, one, 2 by m matrix. And it turns out that if you remove two rows of this matrix, and you divide by the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix obtained by taking the two, column, the two rows from here, i and j, so that determinant is nothing but sigma i minus sigma j. And you remove two rows, k and l, and you divide by k minus kl. Then this object here is independent of the choice that you make. Well, from the silence, it sounds very, very, I can imagine it's very shocking. Yes, it is shocking. But you can show that it's true. But you should be a little bit annoyed, because yesterday we said, well, if you have an anti-symmetric matrix, what is the most natural thing to compute from the anti-symmetric matrix? It's determinant or something else? The Fafian, right? But the Fafian was supposed to be coming from the square root of the determinant. So, but this, it doesn't look nice. We couldn't, take, we couldn't take any square root here unless we make the same choice of rows and columns. So if we do, we will get something like this. And this gives rise to the definition of the Fafian prime of this matrix. Instead of the determinant prime, we can now define the Fafian prime of the matrix.
And the reason I, want to do, I wanted to do this is that I didn't want to leave you with any example until Thursday. So it turns out that if you choose this integrand to be the Fafian prime of this matrix to the fourth power, then you're going to discover, first of all, this theory doesn't have any polarization vectors, so it's a theory of scalars. And it's one that is very, very strange. So I'm not even going to tell you the name. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to you as an exercise to see if you find the name of this theory. I'm just going to write down the interactions. It's a single real scalar. And this formula gives the complete S matrix for this theory. It's something that can be written like this. So that's your, that's your homework until Thursday, when we meet again. OK, okay so let's thank, thank uh, you. <laughs> I'm sure you're all very hungry, but uh, it's time for a couple of questions, urgent questions. Yeah. Can you use the... Um, so, does this rewriting work for any scalar theory or for particular good scalar theories? Can we find curly I for any scalar interactions? The answer is that I don't know. Ah. Yeah. So, it's a, is it an open question? Is it a good question? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, this theory can be generalized. Actually, this theory was discovered where these couplings are all independent couplings. Ah. But only for this particular choice, you can write it in this particular way. And it so happens that this particular choice makes, it, makes this theory the softest theory possible for the scalar theories under a, soft lim under a single soft limit. So maybe there is a connection between finding a nice formula like this and the soft behavior of theories. But perhaps it's just lack of imagination. So this was the simplest possible thing that you can imagine, given the objects that we had on the board. And you ended up with this theory. If you're wondering what this is, this is a matrix. And this is the determinant of that matrix. And the indices are contracted after you expand the matrix. They're going to see that the indices matches the indices match nicely, and you're going to get a theory that has, oh, that one is important there, yes. Another phi. Yeah, it's phi times this determinant. Yeah, otherwise it would be trivial. <laughs> yes. Any other question? Yes, please. Bit of a technical question. So you said that because all the singularity structures encoded by this moduli space, you want i to be polynomial in say k. Um, can't I have a non-polynomial smooth function? Well, you see, if I allow this to be any any rational function, then why not put the amplitude already? The the three-level amplitude is a rational function, so. What you want this machine to do for you is to encode all the singularities. So you don't want to have any poles. So you want every single pole of your S matrix to be generated by the model space. If you put any by hand, then you're risking to have double poles. Well, a rational function that doesn't have any poles is a polynomial.
Okay, well, I guess everyone is very hungry, so let's thank Freddie again.